This is episode 35 of the Progression Health Podcast. I'm here with online coach Shane Story, and Shane is a powerlifter and bodybuilder. Do you want to introduce yourself, Shane? Thanks for having me on, Ross. So yeah, uh, the name Shane Story. I work as an online coach with Triage Method. So that's an online coaching company. We are based in Ireland, but obviously we're online, so we work with people all over the world. Um, I am also a uh, tested IP, IPF powerlifter as well as a natural bodybuilder. Well, soon to be bodybuilder. I'm competing in my first competition in four weeks' time. So it's been a bit of a transition over the last while in terms of, you know, who I help. So a lot of my clients are like late beginners, early intermediates, people who are have essentially tanked out their progress that they can make on their own without making further poor decisions on their part like program hopping you know time wasting so i essentially come in and try to help them make better decisions and kind of keep them on the path towards their kind of overall training goals Uh, and like so ideally like you know my ideal client uh, the the main people i help are people in that scenario who are into strength training into physique development but i don't just kind of specialize in that niche like of course i do still have a lot of Fat loss clients, people just generally looking to improve their lifestyle because one of the kind of things we try to do with triage is we try to get people to create a life that includes uh, like fitness and nutrition as opposed to create their life around it. Yeah, kind of make that lifestyle change. Your initial motivation, what what got you started way back when? Oh, uh, it goes back to when I was a, a wee lad, I suppose. So my, my mom thankfully got me into sports at a very young age. So I think I first started playing any kind of sport when I was like six. Started playing badminton of all things. Like the community I grew up in in Mead had a big badminton club, badminton community. So I was playing that pretty competitively, I suppose, up until maybe my third year in school. And along that kind of way, as I got into secondary school, like we were in a very sports focused uh, college, Gormston College in Mead, and it like it was a half boarding school, so I like stayed in school until half seven every day, and a huge portion of that kind of time after like the class finished at three was just like you know you have free time here, so you're gonna play sports. So pretty much got uh, like got to dip my toes into all sports while I was there. I played m- most most on tennis, basketball, Gaelic, soccer, rugby. But the ones that kind of stuck stuck out to me the most were Gaelic and rugby. So obviously with those sports, you know, there's a good deal of physicality involved. And I was playing midfield for Gaelic. I was playing back row for rugby. So again, like, you know, further physicality needed there. And as, you know, you're getting to your, your later teen years as well, you, you want to impress the girls. So, uh, you know, getting a little bit stronger, getting a little bit more muscle is seems like a, a good idea. Uh, as well as it will help with you know progressing uh, your progression in the sports so I basically just didn't know what else to do and started doing push-ups and sit-ups every night for about half an hour before I got to bed parents probably thought it was nuts but you know I, I did that for geez maybe a year year and a half and then we got access to the college to the school gym when I was in fourth year and then since then I've been pretty much going to the gym relatively consistently. So since I was about 16 um, and thankfully while I was there, there was a guy that like looked over uh, us. So we weren't messing too much <laughs> during that kind of period uh, between uh, class and study in the evening time. And he kind of showed me a lot of ropes in terms of like how to set up a training program, how to train hard, most, most importantly. And yeah, just from there, I suppose it's been a kind of ever evolving journey in terms of you know, learning more about training, learning more about nutrition, uh, progressing myself, and now progressing my clients. Brilliant! Yeah, that's some story. Um, I used to play badminton a lot as well when I was younger. Actually, it's it's uh, it's a great sport for just like having general fitness and stuff as well. Um, oh yeah, 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 that agility. Absolutely, yeah. I lost every bit of it there and I was playing two weeks ago and I was reaching over for a drop shot and I ended up diving across the board and everyone just looking at me like what is wrong with this one <laughs> but uh yeah that's you know just rust but uh so currently now 
you're you're still working out. So what did you get from from working out, you know, doing the push-ups and the sit-ups and stuff like that? The Progression Health Podcast has teamed up with TRX. So TRX is a bodyweight training piece of equipment that you can hook up anywhere, anytime. And uh, I highly recommend it. I use it in every session with my clients. I use it to warm up and also for stretching. Uh, but if you are traveling, which is where I recommend everyone use it, you know, it's hard to get to a gym. Uh, it's hard to find the time. But you could literally work out from your hotel room with the TRX um, and the door attachment that it has where it doesn't damage the door, but it gives you an effective workout. I also like to add in other things like uh, glute bands and uh, resistance bands. Um, but once you have the TRX, then you can figure all that out. So get yourself 50% off on the TRX home workout equipment with the code Progression Health TRX and boost your workout effectiveness and consistency. Progression Health Podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp is an online therapy service which will help you to more effectively manage your mental health. Mental health is very important and it's something that all of us are realizing now, especially after the pandemic. During the pandemic, for me especially, it was very challenging and I, I reached out to BetterHelp. I uh, tried out a few of their licensed therapists and settled on one for the majority of the pandemic and I found that uh, the help that I received invaluable. And the great thing also is that you can speak to your therapist outside of sessions. Um, if it's not working out, you can switch. Very affordable. It's really easy to use also. Um, and if someone hasn't tried therapy before, but you're kind of, you know, you're curious, I would highly recommend BetterHelp. So what we've done is uh, we've got a sign up link I'll attach in the show notes. And basically you can get a discount to get started and uh, start improving your mental health today. So BetterHelp for better mental health. At home, like what was sort of mentally, what was the benefit you were getting to keep you training since you're like 16? So like, what's that like? Six years or so? I'm 28 now. 28, damn, so I'm way off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, the way training is keeping you young. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank, thank God. I suppose it is the elixir of you. Um, yeah, well, it's been a motivation to keep me keep me going. Um, I suppose it's, it's always been something that's kind of given me a little bit of structure in my day. Like, even on days where I have to, where I have to take rest days these days, you know, they, there's still a big portion in the day there that's not being filled by the usual routine. So that's definitely one aspect that I have always enjoyed about it. But generally when, you know, I'm training, everything else in life kind of falls into place. So obviously throughout that entire period, you know, I would have went to university after school. And like like most people, when they go to university, you know, and probably 80% of my time drinking and 20% of my time in classes. <laughs> Uh, but actually, but training was was somewhat there. It wasn't necessarily the best of trainings. It wasn't necessarily the most thought out trainings. Wasn't making the most of progress. Probably wasn't making the most of my early years. But it was it was still there. Um, and it was because it kind of gave me that structure. And it kind of because I was training, I kind of wanted to eat somewhat better. I kind of wanted to get some amount of sleep. Um, it probably helped. I'm I'm sure keep my head intact when I was doing uh, all of that drinking in, in college too and I suppose since, since you know when, when I really started to take it take it seriously it kind of came at a point when I was about to finish up university and I wasn't really sure what type of direction that my kind of life was going to change post university because I wasn't really too interested in my degree and like you know that was something that I always thought was something I had that, that had been constant since I since I was you know very young so I wanted to learn a bit, a bit more about it because like, while I had been training for such a long period up until that point, I hadn't necessarily got the, the physique of people that I would have looked up to at all. You know, I wouldn't have had too much. I would, would have known eating was important, of course, right? <laughs> but it probably wouldn't have been the best best of uh, nutrition. I remember actually uh, when I discovered that, you know, you're meant to get like whatever, two grams of protein per kilogram body weight. And one of my friends, he was working in Manhattan Peanut Factory, and he brought back a box of Manhattan Peanuts. And I shit you not, I probably had about 150 to 160 grams worth of protein from peanuts, uh, like over the course of, 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 of a few days, like consistently. <laughs> so you can imagine the calorie intake. Yeah, I'm serious getting. bulk there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like there was just kind of small things like that when I started to look into it a little bit more because like the kind of year that I kind of, had this epiphany as on as on Erasmus, so I was probably doing a little bit more enjoying myself than anything else, and uh, I wasn't the best student, so I wasn't going to too much class. But I was reading a lot of like Lyle McDonald. I was reading, uh, like I was watching Three D M J on YouTube. I was you know reading. A lot you're, of you're meant to say triage as well. <laughs> yeah, triage as well. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know if triage work uh, back then, but um, but yeah, I, I was like following, I started following a lot of those people, like I discovered Danny Lennon very early on thankfully and then just through kind of watching and 
uh, like consuming all that content, I was like, you know, I, I'm actually really interested in this. So I might be able to see something kind of coming out of this in terms of career. And then I got a lot of kind of encouragement from my friends when I started to get like, you know, good physical results from the from the training I was doing, from the education I was doing, them uh, getting information from me and them seeing results. So, yeah, uh, it's hard, hard to really know what the kind of main kind of drive underlying it all was um, other than initially giving me that structure and then that kind of structure being able to turn into somewhat of having like a purpose day to day and kind of carry on, carrying on that purpose now. Because I think when you're young, you want to like achieve things, you want to do things and make something yourself. So that structure is a bit of achievement in it, I think, you know, just having like that, okay, I got my, I got my one session or my four sessions done for the week or whatever. So there's something to be said for that structure. Um, and just, you're talking about getting like results in the gym and people noticing and stuff. So like, how long did it take, do you think, for you to like see results where you're like, right, this is actually paying off or like I'm getting stronger or I feel a bit more like muscular? Yeah, like, I, I mean, like, in, initially, like, in those first few years, I, I would have gotten somewhat okay results because I was, like, I was, I was still being consistent. And, like, the main, the main kind of thing, even though I wasn't necessarily training intelligently, is, like, I was, tra- I was training hard. Like, any time I go to the gym, like, you know, whether it's uh, the best approach or not, but I was pushing pretty much close to failure, like, on, like, most exercises most of the time, right? So I think, like, you know, if you're going to have – a scenario where you're starting off in a gym and you're doing that versus the opposite side, you know, you're probably going to get more results kind of with the more kind of extreme approach. And so like that, that was something that like, you know, uh, definitely helped in my early, early years. But as I mentioned, like I didn't have much of a reins on like the diet front and like my sleep definitely in college was probably not the best as typical, like staying up until like two or three in the morning, watching Netflix kind of thing and waking up. God knows what error, but because it's probably spent so long not really thinking about my abs or dieting, the, when the time came and I was like, all right, I'm going to download this my fitness pal thing and try to like track macros. That was the kind of time when a lot of stuff was like kind of revealed, you know, and when people start to like, you can have muscle, but if it's clouded by a lot of body fat, people will just be like, ah, he's a big lad, you know? But then when you start to kind of reveal uh, the muscle that is under, underlying there, people are like, he's, he must know his stuff. Like, even though I may not have known much at all at the time, right? Uh, but people see, you know, the, the lean physique and they're like, that guy probably knows his stuff. Should probably ask him a few questions, you know? So that was, I think, geez, my first, the first time I ever dieted was maybe 2014. It was actually prior to going to a J1 because that was the main motivator for me to get in shape, <laughs> going, going on the way to California, like, you know, California girls and all that. Um, so, like, yeah, and then that proceeded going on my Erasmus for a year where, again, like, you know, spent a lot of time soul-searching <laughs> as what I was going to do post-college. So, yeah, that that was kind of a, that was kind of the start of kind of starting to see kind of tangible results and kind of finding out, like, how, how I should actually think about planning out like my years in for progress versus like you know just turning up to the gym and hoping for the best you know i think that like those kind of initial the diet cycles kind of gave me some kind of ideas so like you know if i do kind of want to make progress uh over the long term i should probably plan out things a little bit more in terms of kind of phases as opposed to just winging it and hoping that you know, eventually I'll see something. Yeah, just kind of hitting and hoping type of thing. It's it's cool, yeah. actually. It's like you're saying that the gym gave you a bit of structure in your, li- your life. And then once you kind of got accustomed to working out for a while, then you started putting a bit of structure to how you're actually approaching the gym and stuff. And then you started seeing more results. So it starts, it, like it snowballs over time, which is really good to see. Um, mm, yeah. with, with the fat loss that you were seeing then, uh, how important do you think it is just like, you know, with any fat loss goal to have like, an actual bigger goal attached to it, you know? So you're like, right, I'm going to J1 or I'm traveling. Like, do you think, let's just say you're, you didn't have a show right now, do you think you'd be able to get as lean just like purely by force of will by deciding? Or do you need that like bigger goal? The clients need it as well to really like make a significant change when it comes to fat loss? I, I think so, because like it kind of gives, like the way I kind of put it to clients is like, this is not your end destination, but this is more a checkpoint for you. A checkpoint along your kind of training journey because like like ideally right but anytime you 
finish it out, you're not going to just stop. Okay, but it's going to provide a kind of nice stop off place for you that we can plan out the actual diet, and it kind of forces you to try to be a bit more kind of diligent throughout the weeks. So if somebody has as is like you know I want to lose five kilos, and like how long do you want to, how long uh, by what date or whatever, and like I don't know I just want to lose five kilos. Throughout those weeks, they can be really consistent for maybe a few, and then some other ones they're not consistent at all because they don't have that kind of like deadline to kind of put them under pressure. And then as a coach as well, you can almost be like, oh yeah, well like you know fat is coming off, like you know like it's okay if you so slow things down a little bit but if you say that you know i want to lose five kilos in 12 weeks and i say okay these 12 weeks these are the only 12 weeks that you will have to you know implement these lower calories higher step counts whatever it may be whatever it takes for you to get to the goal and then after that we can go into a more a, a more kind of flexible phase right but if you can commit to like the next 12 weeks you'll see the results and then you can go into a bit more kind of like free ocean swimming. That's going to be a lot more enjoyable for the person versus like, you know, people could spend six months like trying to lose five kilos because they don't have that clear cut date. And like, I don't like, I, I certainly could not get into bodybuilding shape if I had no show plan. You know, if it was just like diet until, you know, whenever, because as well, like the, the timeline dictates your rate of loss so like if you are trying to set up somebody's calories you know if you like again if you're looking to lose uh, five kilos in 12 weeks you say okay well, well five kilos like you know kilo 70 like 7,700 calories or whatever like that let's stratify that over the course of the next five weeks let's plan your calories around that and, and assess your kind of rate of loss that you're going to have versus if you if it's just like oh, i want to lose five kilos whenever it's like well do you want to go hard do you want to go fast do you want to go slow and then some people be like, oh, I want to go slow because I want to be a bit more sustainable. But then the slow and sustainable becomes very boring for them in terms of progress. They lack a uh, kind of discipline to the overall plan, even though it's like slower and sustainable and more flexible. So like, I, do, I do think it, it is kind of best if you do have these kind of things planned out in phases. And like for the most part, like people should not be spending all of their time in a fat loss phase. Like a fat loss phase is, it's it's meant to be a temporary short term restriction of calories and I suppose short term restriction of like living life how <laughs> you should be living life right it shouldn't be something that you're like permanently in uh, so if you can just like commit to like your goal for a certain like short term period of the year like you know the food the flexibility it's always going to be there after the fact so it's just kind of a case of just committing it committing and like thinking about what you want in the long term versus like maybe what you want like in three weeks time when push comes to shove. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, it feels like it adds more structure again to what you're doing. So it's like, right. This is, you know, the start t- point, you know, week one, this is the finish point week, you know, six week, week 10, week 12, whatever it is. And uh, it kind of it guides you then because otherwise you have too much flexibility, you have too much rope essentially, and things don't have any kind of meaning or, uh, any urgency, like you said. Um, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of like telling people to, like telling people to just track macros, but like no guidance on that, you know, because like if like you tell somebody tomorrow that has no idea about like uh, how to build a sustainable nutrition plan or, or how to have a good diet from a health standpoint, just to say, just track your macros, just fill these three numbers. Like, like I've done it before, like you go to a shop and like fill your macros up with like shite, like protein bars, like just like protein milks, way like like loads of like hyper processed stuff that like, yes, you may hit your macros, but like over the long term, it's not a good approach, you know? Uh, whereas like if you say track your macros, but within that, we want you to hit like, you know, protein from these type of sources, fiber from these type of sources, fats from these type of sources, limit this limit that like you know that kind of makes it a lot easier for that person to then have a more sustainable approach while maybe having some flexibility in there and like that person probably gonna be more better off than the person who has all the flexibility because like you know you have that like the paradox of choice right and like if you have too too many options 
you're probably going to pick like ones that are like uh, either way too easy or the most obvious one. And like sometimes they're just not the best choices, especially like you know m- most supermarkets these days. You know the, the the fruit and veg aisle and like the meat aisles, uh, like they're like, the smallest ones, and every, everything else is like packed out to bits with stuff that you know you should definitely be having in moderation. <laughs> just you have too much choice, really. Yeah, when uh, there's no there's no timeline on it, it's just kind of like where do you go, like, and why why are you making this decision? Whereas you cut it down with a timeline and it just gives you such a strong indication of what way you should be leaning. So, yeah. Um, so just kind of going back into like your, your training, you've done a lot of uh, powerlifting shows. So like our competitions or meets, you can decide how you, you phrase them, but how many have you done? And like, what are kind of some of your numbers with like, you know, the squat bench and deadlift? Oh, so I have competed in six powerlifting shows so far. And my best squat is 252 and a half kilos uh, bench 160 and then deadlift is 287.5 so the nice round 700 kilo total so very proud of that <laughs> um but yeah that's that's the result of i suppose the last like three years of committing to powerlifting training and then obviously like the training preceding that would, wouldn't have been powerless powerlifting specific but it still would have been doing spd in some framework but like three years of specific parallels and training with a club with a coach I kind of got me into that position thankfully yeah but they're very impressive numbers so were you always strong you know say from your first time doing squat bench and deadlift or did you see like a huge improvement when you started kind of upping the intensity um I, like like most kind of teenagers I probably focused a little bit too much on my upper body uh when I got into the gym you know I, I vaguely have uh, memories of doing drop sets of uh, we used to work up to a max like a one or one or a max and then once we did that literally as soon as we wrecked the bar we'd take off some plates and then just amrap until you got to the bar <laughs> so i think that's the best best of training approaches but like I, I wasn't i wasn't like i had some lifts that were always like somewhat decent like my deadlift like i think when i was in sixth year i could deadlift 170 which is okay for like an 18 year old um, I think I could bench 120 at the time as well. Funny that, you know, the rate of progress on, on bench has been so slow over those 10 years. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I suppose once I started, like, training them quite uh, quite specifically, I did see, like, quite, I would say quite rapid uh, increase in growth. Like, I mean, like, I like the way I kind of will we'll talk to it, talk to some of my clients is like they may get like a bit kind of like in their head about like oh my numbers aren't like this that and the other or these numbers are probably nothing to you and like I have to remind them that like you know I was in their position before like I was like I I was also had to start from somewhere like I think initially when I was um started to train to squat like twice a week I was like squatting like 120 you know uh and now like you know I'd be doing like 200 for sets now but that that's taken like 10 years or more, you know, and it's not like an overnight change. So like I was, I was, I, w- I wouldn't say it wasn't. I, I don't think my kind of progress has been anything significant in the time span that I've been training. You know, like if you train for anything for a long, long period of time, you're going to get good at it. So it's just kind of a matter of not really thinking too much about the gap between you and the next person but really just kind of focusing on the kind of end outcomes of your training blocks and kind of where you are and like looking at the relative change, like one thing that I, uh, like I hate, right. Cause I, obviously I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a natty elitist, right. And I hate the natty or not debate. And one thing that people always kind of uh, like play up is like, you know, looking at people uh, who are like at the elite level and they're like, oh, they can't, they can't not be on drugs. But like generally, if you look at a lot of people who are at the high level, if you look at their like, relative rate of progression versus other people like percentage wise they're like progressing at a pretty normal right you know it's just you know their their uh, relative percentage is a lot higher than other people's yeah absolutely like you're making me think of my running that i'm doing and like my half marathon time that i'm shooting for next time out i know only from training like the weights and stuff that like so i'm aiming for like five percent improvement in time and I'm like, that's kind of, that's not really like that exciting or whatever, but I'm like, yeah, but that's like 5% improvement. Like that's huge. Like that, if I, if yeah. I keep making 5%, like 
at regular intervals, you know, like you did over your 10 years or, you know, whatever time it was, you know, that really compounds like, you know, if you look back, it really adds up like, so yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, that comparison will, it's like the surest way to demotivate yourself and sort of just get off track. Like it'll, um, you could be, you could be motivated and see someone else's numbers and just completely be deflated and just be like, oh sure. I'm, you know, I'm not that strong. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Like, like even like thinking back to even when I was like working, when I started working at the PT, right. And at the, at that time I was hitting some numbers then that I was like, I never thought I'd be able to do this. Right. Like literally never thought I'd be able to do it. And like the numbers I'm hitting now, I'm like, I never thought I'd be able to do it either. You know? So it's, like a lot of it, like as as you know, would come from like the kind of belief that you can achieve more comes when you accomplish things that you previously thought that you couldn't, right? And that's kind of one thing I tried to like get my clients to like think about more is like, you know, start believing yourself. Like I like since starting uh like strength training and taking it seriously, like my mindset is like like if that guy can do it, like why why can't I? Why can't if I over time like like continue doing it? continue doing what I'm doing where it takes me five or 10 years. Why can't I be lifting the same ways that he's lifting, you know, but that only really happens when you start to think of yourself in a higher way and think that you can achieve those kind of great, greater things. Like, you know, setting, setting goals, like, you know, two, two times body weight squat, one and a half time body weight squat, or like one time body weight bench. You take that off and then you do that and you're like, wow, that was class. What's next? Like, you know, the next increment. And like, you know, over time, you just continually start like, like uh, racking up these accomplishments and you'll start to kind of realize that like, you know, there's not, nothing really kind of that's differentiating you from like the person who's in front of you other than potentially a time component, obviously genetics playing in there. But, like time is like time is probably one of the, it, it is like the greatest like factor in most people's progress, but it's also going to be something that is going to detract from a lot of people's consistency because some people see that kind of time component and they will think of it as you know it's like oh, that's so much work to get there you know and um, i was listening to a podcast uh the other day and like uh the person who was on it was saying that like you know some people will view like even like a hill like in two different ways some people will, like you know look all the, way, all the way to the top and some people look at like you know the next few steps in front of them or like some people see the same hill as like, you know, different like actual kind of inclines. Like some people see it as like lower, some people see it as higher. And then that kind of affects how like people will apply themselves in it. Like like one thing I actually do when I when it comes to like trying to get my steps in now in prep is like I, I do just look at the ground. I don't really look look up. Uh like, you know, thankfully I don't bump into people too much. But the reason I do that is because it just helps me kind of focus on like what's in front of me and helps me focus on the process versus you know, seeing how far I have to go, you know, because like, yeah, if you, if you start comparing yourself or uh, thinking about the time it's going to take you to actually kind of achieve something, you know, it's got, it's kind of demotivate you in a sense. And another great quote that I heard is like, you know, um, don't be, don't be afraid to kind of put in the work uh, for the time that's going to take you because that time's going to pass you by anyway. So may as well do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of like uh, only lift your head to look up and see how far you have to go when you need to type of thing, don't be checking, you know, too far because that will take you off track. And um, yeah, but I feel like it was someone like Gary Vee that I heard say that quote of like, the time's going to pass anyway, you know, but um, I think the most important thing about motivation is like finding what motivates you. So um, that's just like a kind of an individual thing. And like, uh, I think seeing the numbers as well, especially when it comes to lifting heavy and powerlifting is, is a big motivator. So mm-hmm. just like, you know, you've done six meets, like what kind of kept you going to do like five more after you did the first one? Did you like really enjoy lifting heavy or was there something else to it that like kept you going? It's just really fun. <laughs> um, it was like my first powerlifting competition. I did the abs. I think it was one of the, it was the first abs pro weekend. No, it was the second abs pro weekend in like 2019. And I just joined abs. So abs powerlifting uh, based in Dublin. And yeah, like they, they, the setup of the actual venue was class. Uh, there was like tons of people there watching, and like you know, I was, I was competing with a lot of people who were like you know entry level lifters like myself as well. That was nice to be competing with people who maybe have only done one competition before or 
like, you know, we we're only starting off themselves. So they kind of gave me kind of like an even playing field as such. And, but like even like the lead up to the competition, like, you know, I was training in the gym, uh, in the Paradise gym specifically, like maybe two, three times per week. And then in uh, the gym I was working in as well. But like the training sessions that I was doing in the actual Paradise gym, like, well, Paradise and from the outside perspective, it's an individual sport. You're just up there lifting by yourself. But there's a huge kind of team and community aspect to it as well. So like, you know, we'd have our Sunday training sessions. So if you were invited to be part of the 9 a.m. club, you know, that was kind of seen as like a badge of honor. So I was allowed to do that. And that kind of training environment, you know, I was training around a lot of people who are much stronger than me, which also kind of helped with training progression, right? Because like if, I, if you're training with people who are stronger than you, you're seeing that somebody else is already able to do what you want to do. Uh, and as well, you're able to learn from them, like what, like what do they do that makes them so strong? Uh, what's the difference between the two is? Uh, but as well, like, you know, if, you, if you're training with somebody who's like, you know, warming up with like the weights that you are doing your working sets on, your, your tough working sets on, that almost like mentally makes the weight that you're doing less challenging because uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. But when you see somebody like just like repping out like, like your 1RM, you kind of disassociate like yourself from the weight and you're just like this is just a heavy object I'm either going to lift it or not or I'm not and it kind of gives you a little bit more confidence when you're going up to it because you're already after seeing somebody else doing it so you kind of go in with the belief that like you know ah, I'd probably be able to give this a crack but anyway uh, off on a tangent here but what kept, what uh, kept bringing me back to Paris and so obviously that community aspect did help um, but then as well like the actual vibe at Paris competitions is like it, it's it's weird, right? Because, like, again, it's it's an individualistic sport. People are there from other clubs. Uh, people are there who are not from other clubs, but everybody's so welcome. Like, like even if they're from a rival club, like everybody's there to help each other out. You know, cheer everybody on. Like, even like the person who's uh, behind you in placings is kind of like be there cheering you on for your last deadlift. And one thing I really do enjoy about it is like, it doesn't matter where you are in the totem pole, you get your opportunity to perform in front of everybody. So like whether you're squatting 60 kilos or 400 kilos, you get your minute on the platform. And, you know, if you are going into your third attempt deadlift, you know, everybody's going to be on their feet and like, you know, cheering you on. Or like if you're about to uh, bomb, out of, bomb out of a meet. So if you're bomb out, bomb, bombing out of a meet, essentially is like if you miss, um, if you don't make a lift, like say, for example, if you have three squat attempts and you miss two, if you miss the third one, you bomb out of competition and you can't, can't complete the rest. And this can happen. You can make all your squats on the bench, but then by the time you get to your deadlift, if you don't make any of your deadlifts, you still bomb out of the meat. So you get, don't get a total count for it. But like if you're on your, you know, your third, uh, your third squat and you're about to bomb out, like everybody is going to get behind you. Like as that part of the competition at the weekend, and like if it happened, it happened on a few occasions, people, and like everybody in the entire building, like even like the MC commentator, there would be like, you know, kind of, getting everybody riled up to kind of help you pass that lift. So I really did in, enjoy that kind of element to it. And then I suppose it's the ultimate proving ground for your training to date, right? Because like you're being judged to hit these lifts for a certain standard. And if you can do that on the platform with these and judging, you can walk away being like, you know, I definitely lifted that weight. Like, you know, you, everybody knows the person in the gym who, it's like, oh yeah, I, I could bench 180 there and you see them fucking doing like a quarter, quarter inch uh, downward movement of the bar with their arse coming off, up off the bench um, and their friend holding the bar for that quarter inch. So like, you know, <laughs> uh, like, you know there, there's none of that on the paradigm platform. Um, and then from there as well, I suppose obviously, un, unlike, unlike bodybuilding uh, I'm doing at the moment, Powerlifting is it's 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 much less restrictive in in this nature, right? You can do multiple powerlifting competitions every year, and um, and a lot of it is centered around uh, training. It's it's, pro- it's very process oriented, right? And because of that, and because like you know you have these continual checkoff points along the way of your actual like you know meet progression and kind of seeing those numbers trend up, you're able to essentially focus more on the process than the outcome essentially like obviously the outcome like happens on the meet day but like you know the whole kind of journey up to that point is just heavily focused on the training and again you know i i 
would encourage anybody who is getting into strength training in their first like six months of lifting if they're like if they're enjoying doing squat bench deadlift enter into a powerlifting competition you know it's it's it is a great environment to get into the power like the community like and this is not just in ireland but i've been told this like it's the world over it's the exact same everybody's very welcoming very very supportive and you know you might you might just enjoy it yeah i can attest to that completely i was up in abs doing a, a meet and that is literally my experience everything you've described so like i went up there didn't know anyone i you know you'd see a few people on social media and i, I met this fella he was taking pictures of all of my lifts um ended up giving me a lift home everyone's cheering each other and even like backstage it was like the sense of anticipation you could you could feel it like you know and um it was like nothing else you know it was like the adrenaline's going everyone is there we're just trying to like get better just trying to be as strong as we can and it's just like this is it's almost addictive like i would say um so i can see how you could do six of them you know and i always was thinking i want to do another you know do one more at least um so yeah i would echo everything you said there like you know definitely if you like squat bench deadlift if you like lifting heavy give it a go you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain really you know yeah yeah like I, i've met like so many friends through the sport over the years like prior to doing paradise and i didn't have like many lifting friends like about my friends like they, they're just not really that interested in the gym and that's almost the reason why i kind of wanted to get into it because if there's one thing that's going to keep you coming back to the gym it's having a community and like you know if you can show up to the gym and have a chat with people you know and look forward to your training sessions in that way as well like that's one way to keep you in the gym like i like i don't like training in commercial gyms like there's time i i do like there's times like now like for example now that i'm on prep and i just want to get in do my session and get out i get it uh, headphones in you know i don't necessarily want to be talking to, to too many people but like in general like you know if you can have that kind of atmosphere uh, to go to the gym and kind of make gains in that way like that's why classes in gyms are so popular right like my mom goes like is is mad for the gym like mad for exercise but she much prefers going to the classes uh, because all her friends are there you know it's a social thing and like you know obviously that's going to be very good for you as you age uh, if you can't like especially if what competition aspirations have died down you know you don't have uh, as many friends maybe they're dropping like flies <laughs> uh, like or, or can't lift for whatever reason you know being able to get involved in some kind of community atmosphere like that is is great and we, like in in the club there's a lot of like master powerlifters like like women and men in like you know their 50s and 60s who are still in their training putting in the work and i'm sure a lot of that is down to you know well health obviously but like there's a community aspect there you know they're a valued member of the club yeah the community aspect you can't understate it like so um if you can find extra motivation for like working out through your friends or just a group of people like that'll that'll carry you so far especially on the days where like community is so so important it'll uh it'll carry you through the days where you're just not feeling it or the days when you actually have like a, a good lift for example in powerlifting like if you have somebody to celebrate with like that's you know that's what it's all about like you're not going to be celebrating on your own really like so um mm. it just it carries you you know through the tough times and helps to celebrate the, the good moments but Bring it back to what you're doing currently. So Shane, you're, you're prepping for a bodybuilding show. Talk a little bit about like the switch from your training style, nutrition and stuff from powerlifting now to bodybuilding and just like how it feels to be, I think you're four weeks out, is it? So how does that feel? <clears throat> uh, it's it's actually a little bit better now, weirdly, right? Because like for like the last few months, I was over in Spain and we kind of went over there initially like so my girlfriend is doing the prep as well and we kind of went out over there to kind of get away from our Ireland for the summer again some nice weather the he actually made it like probably more difficult I found like the last weeks has been home <laughs> a lot easier in terms of prepping like it's like going out for steps when you were not coming back drenched in sweat and having to take three three chairs a day and you know train in 30 degree heat like you know it's it's not as fun to see not as fun as it sounds um but like I suppose over the last so I've been prepping since March. So I competed in my last powerlifting competition in March of uh, this year, and that was nationals. So the decision to make the switch essentially was 
like my girlfriend she's been prepping for this for like the last like two years essentially for for like you know the bodybuilding shows and i said you know i, I do the prep with her but i had to hit 700 kilo total and i had to qualify for nationals and that they were like the two goals i was like i'm, I'm not making the change from paradise until i do that the reason for it being is like just like the, there's no like prerequisite you need to do bodybuilding but you know i said to myself if i got to go if i got to that level i probably have a decent amount of muscle where i could probably show up on stage and not be laughed at right so uh, that was the decision i i hit the total i reached out to uh, team 3 dmj and started getting coaching with them so i the main kind of changes to my training and nutrition so initially initially nutrition was the biggest change right so i was eating a comfortable 38 to 4 3800 to 4000 calories a day when i was doing powerlifting you know very flexible like going out for meals that kind of thing uh, it wasn't like i was tracking uh, but i was mainly tracking protein calories wasn't really tracking to the gram with cars of fats and then once prep started i got those cut down uh not too much i think it was like 3300 i started off and started off at 3300 and now i'm on 2300 <laughs> so there's been a thousand calorie drop since over like the last six months but it's been gradual right so it's been like um over i think i've had like four or five calorie drops since the initial one so it's been pretty steady like i mean adjusting to portion sizes has been fine uh thankfully because i've been doing this thing for so long i've done so many diet phases i've made all the mistakes there are to make and through that entire process, I've learned how to kind of set up my diet in a way that's going to promote a lot of like good satiety throughout the day, have me with good energy, have me train well, have me retain muscle, that kind of thing. So definitely like the prior diet diet experience definitely paid a huge dividends, I would say, because like based off like now even talking to my coach and like you know, hearing about other people's prep experiences, like some of them sound rough, you know, this I'm I'm still kind of waiting for things to actually start suffering <laughs> because like four weeks out now, I w- would kind of expect me to be feeling a lot worse. Like I do have times throughout the day where I don't have much energy and, you know, some training sessions are not as fun as they used to be. Uh, like my sex drive is, like, has disappeared. <laughs> uh, so like there's definitely like some things that are like downsides to it but i haven't like i would say it's been more than a manageable experience so far and then like from like the and that's definitely that's on like the nutrition front on on the training front it's been a little bit i'd say tougher psychologically because i've had to remove myself from like the more kind of uh, numbers based mindset and kind of moving away from a to b which i was doing with powerlifting to trying to keep things kind of muscle centric um so like initially when we were transitioning away from powerlifting up until i went to spain so that was up until june so between march between march to june i was still running pretty much a powerlifting style training program i was still squatting at uh, twice per week still deadlifting like uh, two three times per week still benching like three to four times per week and i still incorporating like heavy singles mainly because i was stubborn right so i i just didn't want to let go of of that strength i was just like just terrified that it would go uh, but then like once i once i actually left ireland and i left like training in the powerlifting gym like i i could take a little bit of a backseat to the powerlifting mi- mindset and change my program up a little bit to be a bit more kind of bodybuilding centric so i still like squatting and deadlifting but the focus was just slightly different i was more kind of focused on body parts more so focused on uh moving moving loads with a bit more intent versus just moving them from a to b and uh, like the singles went uh so thankfully uh, because they were starting to trend downwards <laughs> um and then in like the last like week or two i've kind of started to pretty much take out a lot of the powerlift so i'm only squatting once a week now only deadlifts once a week now not benching at all uh mainly for reasons that are like yeah the, the powerlifts to to a certain degree they just when you're at my kind of level of body fat at the moment they just don't have a great like stimulus to fatigue ratio you know a lot a lot i, I was still kind of going in with some kind of numbers focused approach to them in a sense so i was trying to hang on to numbers that i shouldn't have been trying to hang on to and after the sessions and after those exercises i was like either dreading going in to do them 
uh, or I was just feeling like immensely fatigued after doing the actual session versus like even in the last week from taking them out, I felt like I've gotten like way more effective training sessions, but I haven't been feeling as beat up. And that's like, you know, four, four, four weeks out for the bodybuilding show, you would think every session I feel like ass after, but I feel much better even from a psychological point of view because I'm not going in with the pressure of, oh, how's this going to feel? I'm kind of attaching my performance on that day to my performance when I was 93 kilos and performing at my best. Yeah, so it sounds like a pretty significant shift like uh, mentally as well. So like to let go of your numbers and not have that A to B approach. So was there like a lot of coaching that sort of like helped you to make that shift or were you able to do a lot of that like on your own as you saw that like the powerlifting wasn't necessarily as effective for the bodybuilding? Yeah, to, to be honest, like, like Brad was um, Brad, Brad was pretty like keen for me to kind of have a lot of the kind of control over the, over the training because he was he's very much concerned that like, you know, I, I'm consistent and I'm getting my volume takes off and how I want to do that up to a point is kind of like, is down to me. Right. Cause like obviously my adherence and enjoyment of training is going to be key. And like, that's like adherence and enjoyment doesn't matter if you're a beginner or advanced, you know, that's just going to be like the, one of the make or break factors of your training. So it was up until I, I started to find that, you know, the, just the paradise just were not as enjoyable as they once were and then as well it just has to remember you know it's not the goal at the moment you know paradise is going to be there after my bodybuilding competition it's not going anywhere fast and like i think i think like personally it was a little bit hard to let go right because like you feel like you're kind of losing a little bit of your identity when you do let go of it. and yet there's also the kind of fear that like i'm stopping doing it now and it's going to take me so long to get back to my old strength levels like but like what what it's harder to learn a new skill than it is to like relearn one that you've had. And when you've been training for so long, you kind of do realize that like there is going to be a lot of kind of setbacks throughout your kind of training journey. But like once you, once you just don't stop, like uh, you're going to get back to where you want to be. And like one thing that kind of gives me comfort as well is like, there's plenty of people who have been the exact same position as me. You know, there's plenty of people who've done powerlifting and bodybuilding and after bodybuilding have went on to, do even better in their powerlifting journey you know so again it kind of comes back to that kind of checkpoint versus end destination kind of thing that was, I, I talked about at the start because yeah like ultimately i would have been more i'd be i would be it, future me would be way more disappointed if i decided to not do this because i couldn't let go of powerlifting uh versus like now when i look back in a year's time and i'm like damn i went through bodybuilding prep meant to be one of the hardest things <laughs> that that you can do um I, I, i'll be very happy with like the kind of the kind of approach and kind of efforts like before during that and then obviously all the kind of lessons that would have would have learned through this process and how that can help help me help my clients in the future as well it'll be interesting to compare how uh, you feel about bodybuilding once you've got it done we'll fast forward about eight weeks or, or yeah 10 weeks or 12 weeks whatever um and it's interesting it's like in the last podcast, we were saying uh, food will always be there, right? And it's kind of like powerlifting will always be there too. Like, you know, you've you've already pretty much, I don't want to say mastered it, but you've done very well in it. Like, so you have that skill there. Whenever you want to tap into it again, you just, you come back to it. But right now it's like, you're trying to, instead of be as strong as you can, you're trying to look as muscular as you can. And, you know, you're flying it. So that's really good. And just, you talked a little bit about kind of like some of the side effects, like, like your libido and your energy and, Will you just talk a little bit about that? Just because I hear like a lot of clients are like, I want to get six pack abs or I want to be like, I don't know, you know, you, you see some people, they want to do like crazy transformations and, and that's great. Like you should definitely want to better yourself, but I don't think they realize like the sacrifice you have to make to get like very lean or the changes in your life that come about. And obviously there's a lot of good stuff, but just to kind of the side effects. So we'll just talk a little bit about the reality of being very lean. Yeah. Like, like being, being lean, like it looks great, right? Like, but that's about all it really does, <laughs> right? Like, like for for most people, unless you have a really low body fat set point, like, like your body doesn't really want to be there. Like everything kind of starts to down down regulate. Like, like one thing I mentioned there is like like sex like sex drive like like just plummets, right? Because like once energy energy availability goes low, then you know that's one of the first things kind of get shut off, right? Reproduction is not uh, uh, like important right now. You need to go find some food, and. Um, 
and then like you now a lot of people who want to get really really lean well a lot of them are motivated by sex and then they get really lean and they can't have sex they don't want to have sex they just think about food you know that's all they want um, and then as well with that as well like if like if you are not getting a coach well through the actual process you know you can you can really fuck yourself up by apologies if I, if I can't curse uh, but um, you can really mess yourself up by uh, get, getting really lean right because like one of the kind of consequences that come, comes with it is like depending on how you're doing it if you're doing it in a very very restrictive manner like you could end up like giving yourself like serious uh, like like eating issues and, and like really like um really negatively impacting your relationship with food because like one thing that like is like very often talked about in like the bodybuilding scene and i'm yet to go through it is like the post-show period and like i've done many diets in the past and i can tell you like from getting really lean and coming out of those that kind of post diet experience it's very tough mentally to see yourself change back to where your body naturally wants to hang out with like in terms of body fat but it's also very tough to kind of see how your behaviors go in terms of food because you go from this like really disciplined kind of mindset around food and then you get to your end goal and then you go into kind of free ocean swimming and if you don't have any kind of coaching around that that could mean like you know burger fr- burger and chips and pizzas like multiple times a week like you know i i i, I remember like getting really really lean before and like god I, i'd go into the shop and buy like a box of cocoa pops finish the entire thing maybe get a bag of cookies as well finish the entire thing and like you know you you feel awful because like obviously you've satisfied some kind of craving but then like you look at yourself in the mirror you look all bloated you look all, all watery you think oh this uh, other work other work i've done is is ruined whereas like you know to, to get to that position and like especially if you don't have any support through it it can be very tough because you can fall into the kind of then uh, more of a binge restrict cycle where like you're trying to m- maintain the lean physique you have, but maintain that lean physique is causing you to be way too, restri- too restrictive. You feel you're being too restrictive and then you end up being like, I'll just have one pizza and then you end up like ordering everything from Domino's and then like you do that all, all over and over again. And then what ends, what ends up happening is you end up having a very poor relationship with your body and your food, but then also you will probably end up looking much worse uh, over time as well, because like you're probably going to exceed the rate of kind of healthy regain of body fat that you're going to get per week versus if you kind of took a little bit less of an aggressive approach, like, you know, kind of settled for something that is not too extreme in terms of body fat levels. Like I think for most people, you know, like 10% is like, 10% is like more than lean, like more, more like lean enough, like for most people to get to, right? Like anything sub 10, like nothing good really comes from, from that. Okay. Unless it's going to be short term, but you know, getting the 10% and some of visible labs, like that's like achievable and semi maintainable for a lot of people. Well, I can, I can tell you now if somebody has been at, you know, both kind of ends of the spectrum of being like, you know, 98 kilos like two two years ago uh when i was at like peak bulk and like like now when i'm 80 80 kilos like I, I i can tell you that like i was i was happier when i was like in the kind of mid 90s like life was way easier less restrictive i could go out for food with my friends go out for a night i sit with my friends i could you know have good training sessions i could uh like you know go to the bedroom with my partner <laughs> um like, you know, there's lots of kind of benefits that came from it that people take for granted when they are kind of living a more kind of healthy body fat range. Like, yes, like, it, does it look cool? Does it look cool to get some pictures uh, for the gram? Or, like, is it uh, a worthy pursuit pursuit to put yourself through the actual kind of diet, like a hard diet in face to see what you can achieve when you put your mind to it? Like, for sure. But, like, I just wouldn't see it as like the pinnacle as, as to what somebody should really be striving. For. Yeah, it's definitely a good experience to go through and it's not with, without its uh, side effects. And it makes me think as a general rule, like if there's like a position stand from like some sort of uh, agency within the health and fitness industry to be like, it's recommended when you get below like X body fat level that, you know, when you're going for a prolonged diet phase, you get a coach or you get a an experienced uh, 
confidant who can give you a little bit of assistance because like yeah your hunger drive and stuff like that can really message your, your mindset and and kind of like get you to you know get into that binge restrict cycle which is terrible to be in like it's really a challenge and um you can you can definitely avoid it if you have a little bit of support so definitely something to keep in mind um and just something else as well in terms of being lean and, and training and the 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 squat bench and deadlift when you're lean so they feel totally different can you just talk a little bit about you know how does it feel on your body to do the squat bench and deadlift lifting heavy and just kind of like navigating injuries and, and aches and pains in general yeah i think like the one that most people are gonna find is like the first to go and the worst is gonna be the bench press hence why i'm not doing it at the moment like a few, few reasons i suppose like well number one you're gonna just be like there's less human that's going to be taking up space on that bench right so you got less of a base support which you have a heavy barbell resting over it's a little bit harder to kind of get a kind of very solid arch as well in place in my experience at least you know the, the range of motions increase like so with the arch there for example you start losing like a lot of body fat around your arse like you know that's going to decrease the size of of the arch that you're going to have there to create more sensitivity to your upper back now again more body fat coming from the upper back more body fat coming from the chest you know it's going to be an increase from there right so the wrong where you usually would have been training true that's like fine you're kind of adapted to that to that kind of specific lam uh, rom <laughs> lam rom um diet uh, adapted, diet brain kicking in here <laughs> <laughs> you're uh, adapted to that specific rom right but then like you know as you start to gain those extra like few centimeters or millimeters even like you know you those kind of last few millimeters may not be and then maybe you're putting more kind of force through like more passive structures that haven't been accustomed to that load and therefore and they're through that because you were seeing the load tolerance of those areas maybe a little bit, bit more kind of aches and pains start to pop up and um, and then as well just the stability like issue again like you know if you are trying to stabilize a heavy load coming down over your chest you know it's and you're kind of bracing and your arch is not as good like it's generally just not going to feel as secure as something like you using like a machine uh, chest press, for example, where, you know, you can relatively easily like kind of fail a weight, a weight there, like, you know, and you're not going to like decapitate yourself or anything. Um, and you can potentially get yourself a little bit more kind of stable and locked in. And you probably won't be as attached to the numbers that you're using on a selectorized machine or a plate load machine versus when you are using a barbell bench yeah, so it's all about the, the joint angles that completely changes and um you're making me think that i should start a big bulk just to get uh, my numbers up so that i have better angles and stuff but following on from this a recent debate that was uh going on is uh, uh kevin bass he put up a post he's like the squat and deadlift are dangerous specialist lifts uh they should not be used by most people and I thought it was a very interesting debate. And I have my own opinions about it. But yeah, what are your thoughts on most people doing the, uh, well, just say the big three, right? Uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that debate? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting debate. Like, I, to be honest, after the initial few posts, I just kind of clocked out because it seemed like he was like uh, just trying to be contrarian <laughs> and, and just get on people's nerves. But like, look, for the most part, like they are, Retrieve the most common lifts that people are going to do in the gym, right? So just by sheer virtue of being retrieved the most common exercises performed by most people in the gym, they're probably going to have a higher rate of people getting injured from them, right? Because like, like, there's a whole sport centered around the actual thing themselves. You know, people are going to see that. And they're like, right, I'll go in and try these exercises. And if they go in without prior training experience, like, you know, if they try to load up a bar, like, and are performing things with uh, like techniques that are like again exceeding their kind of low tolerance for the, for those days then yeah sure they could get themselves injured a lot of people do go into the gym and train with poor, poor training practices right a lot of people go in and will like just go in and max out or they'll go in and do like you know amrap sets like i used to do and um, and like you know some are going to be lucky some are going to be not so lucky right and then all of a sudden and I've seen them with clients before, like, you know, they, you know, they start to blame uh, like a specific, specific exercise, but like, who's to say if we didn't have uh, like three different exercises, right? So I know he put forward some 
uh, other like exercises like split squats or like you know trap bar deadlifts um, and I forget like other other ones. Uh, but like who's say if they weren't the most commonly performed exercises in the gym that there wouldn't be a ton of injuries from them, you know? And um, because at the same time it just comes back to like the like like how much load can your kind of joints kind of tolerate and how much kind of training stress can they tolerate over a given period of time. And then we also have to factor in it's not just your training. Like, you know, we know that like outside variables like like account for uh, pain. Like, you know, if you are if you have a higher higher stress day, if you poor night sleep, if you have poor hydration, poor nutrition, uh like you know, all of that can factor into your recovery status and your training uh, performance capabilities on any given day. So, you know, again, if we have that, if we if we have like issues like like that, which a lot of people do deal with a lot of those issues and not everybody has them perfect. And we are talking about like three of the most common exercises that are performed in gyms all over the place. Like, like yeah, there may be slightly higher injury risks, but is it the exercise themselves or is it other factors? Like, you know, because like, again, like if we just take the example of like the split squat and uh, the hex bar deadlift, like there's not a huge amount of difference in terms of like, you know, joint angles between a hex bar deadlift and a regular deadlift, you know, and that's going to vary depending on somebody's structure as well. Some, some people when they perform a hex bar deadlift are going to be a lot more, more upright. Some are going to have a bit more of a hinge in their hips and uh, the split squat. Some people are going to have their knees go f- way further over toes than other people's. And so like, that's again, going to bias, like, you know, different muscle groups kind of bias different tendons that are being used. So like, you know, there's so much kind of very variability within uh, those kind of things that it's very hard to say that like, oh, it's those exercises specifically. And like, obviously, right, people are always going to be clouded by their own biases. So like, you know, I'm 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 a powerlifter, so like, obviously, I'm going to be like rooting for the uh, the squat bench and deadlifts. But a lot of my clients, I don't necessarily do those exercises. Like, I don't. Like if they don't want to do those exercises, I won't get them to do it. If they've had a bad experience with a deadlift before, I'm not. I'm probably not going to program them deadlifts unless they ask me to. Like I'm not going to like force them to do a deadlift uh, and just try to be like, oh well, we shouldn't be catastrophizing or like you know, uh, like fear mongering around this lift. Like you know, you should expose yourself to it. If they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. You know, there's other exercises that they can surely progress uh, in their goals with. Um, and again, like yeah. It, personal experience you know if somebody's injured themselves with it of course they're going to be like well you know this is a bad exercise especially if it happens repeatedly but we know that one of the most common indicators of if you get injured is if you've been injured before so you know if you do the same silly silly things over and over again you may get injured you know yeah it's it's like what your own coach said about like enjoyment um that's like the, the biggest thing so if you enjoy doing these exercises of course you should do them, but just be mindful of the fact that like, you know, maybe you need to really pay attention to uh, the weight you're lifting, your technique and stuff. And you can definitely do it in a safe way. And I think that's uh, terrible advice that any exercise is dangerous because, you know, most people don't exercise enough. So um, this yeah. kind of fear mongering is just, it's just a terrible look, but um, that debate is, is put to bed, I hope. But um, Shane, thanks very much for your time. It's been really, really good talking to you. Is there anything you want to uh, mention before we wrap up? Any messages or uh, uh, plans you have coming up? No problem, Ross. Thank you very much for having me on. It's been a it's been an honor. It's been a good conversation. Um, yeah, so I suppose like if you want to uh, follow more of my content, I am documenting my prep process on YouTube. So you just search my name, Shane Story. I should pop up there. The series running Paradise and Paradise or to Bodybuilder. Who knows what's going to happen after the bodybuilding takes place, but we'll see uh, after it ends. But yeah, you can follow me there. You can follow me on Instagram at story 94 And then, yeah, um, yeah, if you have any questions for me following the podcast, just drop me a DM on Instagram. I'm pretty open to answering people's questions. Yeah, and uh, very knowledgeable. So uh, best of luck with the prep, Shane. And uh, thanks very much for coming on.